One minute, your life is as you expect, predictable. You're at home in your own body with complete control over your ability to move, talk, see, and feel. And then that all changes. An unforeseen force completely knocks you over and you are dropped into a new world where things do not make sense. You are bewildered. Your words are coming out wrong and your brain and body have lost connection. There is fear and there is confusion. Slowly, you start to make sense out of what has happened. You can't move your right arm. You have aphasia and they say you've had a brain bleed a hemorrhagic stroke in the middle cerebral artery. With the help of the hospital doctors and therapists, you start to understand this new obstacle in front of you is called a stroke. And you realize that in an instant, you have a new identity. You are now a stroke survivor. In the hospital, you have structure, you have support, you have a schedule, and then you are again on your own, facing another uncertain future with no map of where to go. A couple outpatient therapies, a few follow-up appointments, and then it's all up to you. How will you find your way? How will you accept what has changed? This is the challenge of every stroke survivor. Hemorrhagic strokes happen in about one in four people with stroke and is due to a weakened blood vessel that has burst in the brain and damages surrounding tissue. The damage is due to both interruption in normal blood flow, which prevents brain cells from getting oxygenated blood, but there is further damage from the compression of brain tissue that happens because of an increase in pressure. Neurological recovery can feel chaotic. Neurons swarm to reconnect, migrating in deep sleep and through repetitive and increasing difficult therapy efforts to find new pathways and support a return to function. But recovery from a stroke is not just neurological. This is not just medical rehab. This is a psychological journey. This is trauma healing at a deep level, learning to love yourself and your life as you now are. Listen in today as Jerry tells us how he found his way back to himself and into a new and incredible community. His hemorrhagic stroke happened in 2010, and since that time, he has developed epilepsy, a not-so-uncommon long-term symptom of his type of stroke. Together, Jerry and I talk about the challenges and triumphs of his stroke recovery and how 13 years later, he now considers himself not just a stroke survivor, but a stroke thriver. The I Care For Your Brain podcast starts now. Hey, Jerry. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today and and learn all about stroke in your area, middle cerebral artery and seizures, because it hasn't just been the stroke for you. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we should tell everybody that we've known each other for a couple of years now. Yeah, I think it's been, yeah, several years. Several awesome, awesome years as, as friend and colleague and teacher and student in both directions. Absolutely. I've learned so much from you. It's been a blessing. And likewise. Yeah. So I'm really eager to talk about, you know, some stroke specific things, some seizure stuff. And then what's really so impressive to me about you is how you turned your sometimes traumatic experiences into advocacy. And you've got your show, Let's Talk Stroke. And you've just, you know, gotten the attention of so many people online and have supported so many folks and have tried to tell their story, which is kind of what I'm trying to do here on this podcast. Right, right. Yeah, yeah it's been a, it's been quite a journey. Oh, it's my gosh. Amazing. I am mad. So it's been about 13 years since you had your stroke, right? Yeah, October 19, 2010. So just coming up on 13 years. Oh, my God. And how old were you when you had the stroke? I was 49. Wow. And was that totally out of the blue? Did you have any warning signs that might might happen that you were at risk? You know, I've been going through a lot of a lot of uh, like um, trying to write a book and I went through a lot of things. And I noticed that about a week before Mm -hmm. that I had my stroke, I was getting a bunch of bloody noses and I didn't know why. And the only thing I can attribute that to, at least I thought, was the uh, in Texas, the the weather here, allergies, 
So I've kept, I blew it off. And then all of a sudden, walking to my bedroom, I stopped. I didn't know. And I was so naive, didn't know what a stroke was. Oh, of course. Right. Yeah. And, and, and being of a younger age, you just don't have in your mind. I mean, that can be part of the psychological trauma is it wasn't something you expected at all. Right. Right. Exactly. I thought it was just for the elderly. That's how I right, need Right. Right. And, and younger stroke survivors do have a different journey. And that's where I think a lot of your service has really been very well received is you are a younger guy and you know you don't look like the picture of someone who's had a stroke you right. know it, especially so you had a hemorrhagic stroke correct and that's almost typically caused by high blood pressure was that the case for you you know i i never knew i i talked to i've talked to my neurologist and he never said i had the i that i had high blood pressure um and I went through so much information of my records and all that, and I never saw anything on there. I, I know I, I'm sure I sent it to you just to take a look and think, what caused it? And I don't yeah. know, but uh, the um, that I, I always thought it was the bloody noses. So I'm still researching all the records. Okay. Well, yeah. I know from the, the records you sent me, they did do a pretty comprehensive workup. And, you know, the sad truth is, the younger we are when we have a brain injury, the more effort doctors probably put into figuring it out, right? So right. I know you had um, not only just an MRI that shows the structure of the brain, but you had an MRA, which shows the blood flow. Because one of the things we think about with younger folks is aneurysm. Right. And you didn't have any, it wasn't, it wasn't a developmental thing. It wasn't that your blood vessels were um, kind of physiologically misshapen or there was a kink in them or something like that. So right. especially when it's hemorrhagic, which is about one in four people who have strokes have the bleeding kind, it's almost always high blood pressure. So, you know, sometimes I remember when I was training, there was a woman who never had blood pressure problems before, but she saw her son's arm get caught in a car door that slammed shut. And yes. her blood pressure just went through the roof and she had a stroke, which, wow. yeah, a, a little bit, a little bit scary there. But, um, yeah. so in, in the type of stroke that you had in, so yours is in the left middle cerebral artery, there's four blood vessels that it could be in. And I think this is an interesting point for folks listening because you really had the classic stroke syndrome. That's the most common place people have a stroke. Um, but what we don't know is that they'll say it's a left MCA stroke, but the MRI really isn't of strong enough power to show which of the four branches it happened in, because it can affect all different parts of the brain, the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, the parietal lobe, or kind of deep into the subcortical structures right. where the thalamus is. So typically time we go from symptoms backward to try to figure out exactly where it is. So most people with a left MCA stroke have the classic syndrome of aphasia. So trouble, and it, you know, left hemisphere in the front is where language is located. And then spastic hemiplegia on the right side. And that really captures some of your struggle, right, Jerry? Absolutely. It's, it's yeah. 100% um, how I am. I, I still have the issue with aphasia. Um, sometimes I could be talking and I completely forget what I'm saying. It's, yeah. um, it's almost kind of, a, I hate to even say it, it's comical in our house because everybody in my, in my family knows how I am. Right. Uh, but yeah, it is my right side and uh, that has been affected. And, mm -hmm. um, but yes, but me having the seizures is, I'm getting pretty good at it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hate so to say so I, I reminded myself of some of the literature on stroke and seizure because I knew you wanted to talk about that today. So you have delayed onset. So if you have a seizure within the first three months, right. it's thought to be very clearly related to the certain kinds of stroke mechanisms. But yours was, was it about a year later? Yes, it was about a year later when I had my first one. Yeah. And yeah. Do you get symptoms on that same right side of your body? Absolutely. I, yeah. uh, I get really the main two um, reasons or what I feel is I smell smoke. Yeah. Not all the time, but I do. I smell smoke. And, um, and the other, it, I feel a tremor in my right foot and it usually comes right up. And I can remember, I, I still remember it comes up and, and um, now that I'm getting, 
it's been about a year or so, but when I start to feel it come on, yeah, and if I'm sitting, I'll stand up right away and it goes away. Interesting. Yeah, so if I wait there. Oh, that's really interesting. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I having looked at your MRIs and read the report, you know, what happened to your brain after the stroke is what typically happens. So we have a core area of damage that will read in the MRI report as encephalomalacia, which is kind of just a softening of brain tissue after damage. But what we think where the seizures come in is there's kind of an umbrella around that soft tissue called gliosis, which is basically scar tissue. Right. right. So that's the idea is the cortex of the brain has a lot of brain matter that is very excitable and irritable, especially after an injury. So the seizures are really a grouping of brain cells that are firing together. They're basically getting too excited. And and you can see that it mimics some of your original stroke symptoms, right? Right, right. Exactly. The the challenge, though, is this balance between, you know, for, for every seizure we have, it is a little bit of brain damage. Yes. And but the cure for the seizures is sometimes just as hard to live with as the seizures. And so I thought that would be something that people might appreciate hearing about is kind of your experience with the seizure medications and how that might contribute to some brain fog that you feel like you have. Yeah, I do. And I do. I started out with uh, Keppra, uh, like 500 milligrams of Keppra. Mm -hmm. And then I was still having the seizures. So they put me on Depakote Mm. and that made me shake more mm-hmm. just all the time mm-hmm. and um so now currently i'm on 3000 milligrams of kepra and 400 milligrams of um vimpat mm-hmm. and uh and that doesn't seem to um you know take care of the seizures um because my doc says or the neurologist says well we still have you we still have room that we can up your kep your kepra but um You know, I've been diagnosed with epilepsy as well, and uh, I've been. But my neurologist, my I had one neurologist. Neurologist in the beginning was absolutely amazing. He really took time to care for me, listen to what I was saying. Mm -hmm. So about seven years, six years later, I have a new neurologist. I I I don't (laughs) want to bash him or, and but he gave me the you know every time I went in he was. Like, why do you call the, um, or go to the doctor every time you have a seizure? Well, um, and he, and he, every time I tell him, well, he just had another seizure. All he does is he gives me the, oh, I'm so sorry. That's it. Yeah. I mean, th- that is such a, a, a thing that people crave from their brain health experts. You know, research tells us it's really two things that people want. It's expertise and warmth. Right. And, and genuineness, right? Yes. So it sounds like the difference in the one before was they would take a lot more time to focus on education. Right. Exactly. He really, he gave me that warm, warm, fuzzy feeling and he Mm. he explained everything to me, which I really love. And uh, he retired, but that's the thing I loved. He actually, uh, when I go in, he, you know, gives me the, all the tests all the time, not here. All he cares about now is just typing in the computer and, I don't know if it's cover and bases just to, that I, right. I went there and did, did what I was supposed to do, but it's and in and out. That That's such an important point is that for any stroke thrivers who are listening, you really have to take your recovery in your own hands. If you just went by the traditional insurance based yes. medicine, I mean, you would get, you know, maybe 12 sessions of physical therapy, maybe occupational, maybe speech. And especially 13 years later, you would be given the feedback like, hey, this is the way it is. You better just accept it. But I know that your approach is that you're always trying to do new things that are therapeutic and you're always trying to contribute to this ongoing recovery that you really will have for the rest of your life. Yes. And I I 100 percent believe, you know, how the brain rewires itself. I've seen the results from day one till now and I yes. still go six months a year um to um OT and PT physical therapy and occupational therapy and I just accepted and my wife's so happy that I have accepted um after I'll just say 10 years I've accepted that I do have some speech um issues so I'm going to speech therapy 
oh. and I only re went. She recorded me, the therapist, and I, oh my gosh, I don't sound like I thought I sound. Yeah, that's really interesting. So, what would you say? Like, what are what are some things that you think thirteen years later? people really should advocate for themselves to get like, what are some of the the secrets do you think? Cause you know, I can see, obviously you have some residual aphasia, but you know, one of the ways we gauge aphasia is the burden on the listener. So how hard is it for me to really understand what you're trying to say? And I feel very little burden talking to you. You, yes, sometimes your, your retrieval is a little bit slow, and I know that gets worse with fatigue yes. or anxiety or hunger, right? Um, but but overall, I mean, I think your aphasia has, wh wh when it first happened, Jerry, was it significantly worse than it is now? 100%. I couldn't talk. And then oh. when I talked, you know, it took me about six months to kind of get a word out. It really is wow. amazing. When I look back, at, um, I wish it had recorded. Like I see a lot of people now yeah. are taking videos of themselves. And we didn't do it then we just right my family was devastated oh of course so i do want to know those tips but actually now you got me thinking about something else in that six month period when you couldn't talk give us some insights into what was that experience like for you were you aware were you afraid yeah you know, for me i could hear understand what everybody was saying yeah. And I wanted to say something. So it was almost like I'm using sign language, mm. uh, but I couldn't, uh, couldn't speak anything. I could say a couple words here and there, but they didn't make sense. But, mm. um, but yeah, they, my wife, she pretty much can tell what I was thinking of, you know, being married coming up in 40 years. Um, it was, um, it was, it was difficult me trying to sit there and not, uh, be able to say anything. I've had people come visit me while I was in the hospital and they didn't care that, that I couldn't talk. They just talked to me and I, you know, just yes or no answers. Yeah. That's, all, that's all I could do. But right. um, my, when I talked to my daughter, my, I have four kids. One of them says, you, um, you were so depressed. I never felt that I was depressed and picked off at life. But uh, um, so, but oh. it well, wasn't, yeah, I mean, I think there's two really important points there. One is it's really important for people to know that just because someone has a hard time getting speech out right. doesn't mean they're having a hard time with receptive speech. So they might be able to understand because, you know, a lot of times people think aphasia means, you know, totally out of it or you're you you right. are. So it sounds like when people engaged you, even if you couldn't reciprocate in kind of a usual conversation, that it made you feel part of the group and you felt their concern. Absolutely. I uh, I know it's not a loss of intellect, but it's just really loss of right. language. And, right. Uh, but, but some of the most painful things I've heard from people is being ignored or excluded or people come to visit and they just focus on the wife. And that's how it still is for the most part here. And if we have a bunch of people over, it still bothers me when there's someone talking. I'm trying to concentrate with them. Yes. And some other people are. It's just the the different conversations. That still is an issue. But I I feel like I've learned how to handle it. Yeah. Um, and doing what I'm doing, I've learned so much from. I mean, like Kristen, I, I've watched I've watched all your podcasts and um, listen to their their um their stories. Yeah. Uh, I learned even from that what what she's going through because I can relate. Yes. Uh, both of them that I, I've seen. Uh, yes. The, yeah. the brain injury family is so similar and so different at the same time, you know? Yeah. And so you're the first person we've had on that's had stroke. You're also the first guy. You're our first dude, Jerry. <laughs> 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 um, and so what, what are some of those secrets to your success? Do you think, because I think you know, when we look at any trauma, there is a cycle, there's like kind of an organic way it unfolds. And some of the final stages are when you can use your pain to lessen the pain of someone else. So when I see you doing let's talk stroke and strive for greatness, to me, that is so powerful, because you're showing people, not only can I learn to live alongside this change, right but I can actually do something that's going to help the community. So, but, but I think there's a whole backstory of how you grew to be able to do that. Right. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it is pretty amazing how it has changed because the first few years of my after my stroke, I was lost. I didn't realize there was a Facebook page and uh, you know, other people out there that had a stroke yeah. like me. But then I start after you know, my because one of my hobbies was flying airplanes. So my my wife says, go to the airport and just try to volunteer. Uh, I mean, I couldn't really walk good. I couldn't um, use my right side. I turned right around and go home. Oh, I didn't think that's going to work. So I did that. And um, then I got involved with Facebook and started meeting all these other people and got involved uh, not maybe six years ago with some some other group to do uh, interviewing uh, stroke stories. But then my kids actually really won. They got me hooked up on, you know, graphics and all that stuff. And oh, yeah. one thing led to another. So it's been four or five years that I'm doing myself interviewing strokes about brain injury or experts in brain health that, that can share their knowledge like you with us that we can learn. And it's been so fulfilling for me. And I could, uh, I've learned so much from that. And it's, yeah. it's, it's amazing how I've learned oh, from, yeah. from them. Cause every, like you said, every uh, story, every, brain injury is unique. They're all different. Right. Right. You know? But there are these themes and that's why I think I wrote the stroke recovery guide because there really are like 10 rules of rehab that, you know, it just has been so heartbreaking for me to hear mm. my patients come in and say, you know, it's been five years. I don't even know where in my brain I had my stroke. You know, I had a little bit of physical therapy in the hospital, but I've never seen a neuropsychologist. I have no idea what kind of cognitive changes I have. And I still can't use my arm. So this thought was, okay, just, just write this book where at least if people had access to the 10 rules of neuroplasticity, yes. that they could apply them wherever they are in the world. Right. So you know, some of the most important stuff is, you know, getting really good assessments to understand what is your therapy target. Right. Exactly. Because even just not being able to use your hand, there can be 20 different reasons. That could be a brain down problem. It can be a tight, a muscle tightness problem with spasticity. Right. It can be, I know I with you, you had a pre-existing shoulder problem in that same side, which right. then, ex so there's, we have to, one big thing is to not reduce people down to their brain injury. You still are everything else in addition to that, you know? Yes. you know, uh, shoulder tear, uh, you know, pre-existing depression, it all goes in the pot. So we can't just treat people like, you know, the only thing they are is a stroke survivor. They're still a complex human being. Right. Right. It, yeah. it, it's, um, I've learned to really advocate for myself. Yeah. That's one of the biggest tips I would give to anybody you've got. You can't yeah. just sit back and doctor tells me, you know, okay, just you're, that you've been, you've plateaued and I've been told that you've plateaued after about two years I plateaued I thought wow that's it and um, they finally learned you know I, I'm gonna not listen to everybody I'm gonna really and I, I've met so many uh, great um, occupational and physical therapists that really treated me like I was somebody yeah. you know and, they, and then and you I fed after them and now now I'm speaking at, at stro stroke support groups trying yeah. to give them like some encouragement. Yes. And, you know, really right. Makes... And, and so surrounding yourself with people who think positively and are informed, because it's not just like blowing smoke to say to no. someone, hey, you're going to keep getting better if you put in more and more effort. That is the science, right? Right. But, you know, not not wanting to be a conspiracy theorist, but is it a coincidence that insurance pays for about six months to a year of therapy? And that's what people tell us is the maximum time window of recovery. I don't think it's a coincidence, right? No, right. Exactly. If they said it's lifelong, they'd be paying for rehab forever. Right. They, exactly. They don't give you enough. Well, really, I've noticed, too, doing what I'm doing, I've noticed that when you go to the hospital, when you get discharged, yes, it's like there's no information. No one gives yes. you anything and tells you, okay, then you need to go do this or exactly. Or they just give you the information, say good luck or exactly. Something. That's it. There's nothing for the caregiver too. Right. Oh, yeah. totally. Right. And so that's part of what we've done here locally in my hospital system is everybody who's discharged is given a free copy of the stroke guide. Nice. So again, you know, I'm just one person. I can only see so many patients in real life, but right. even if people just had the basics, when people are motivated and they have a care partner, because I, I think too, your wife has been a part of your success with- absolutely 
so in your dog, you know, your kids support encouragement, but, but people who remind you that there really is, it's realistic to think you're just going to get better and better. If you have negative people around you or people who don't um, encourage you, because you have to be encouraged. It, it is small steps. I will say that, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes in the very beginning, you, you can get some leaps and bounds, you right. know, you might wake up one day because, you know, so much of recovery is dependent upon sleep. That's one of those rules of rehab, deep sleeping. I know we're going to talk about that. Um, but, you know, it, that's where the care partner comes in. If they understand the rules of neuroplasticity, every day can be rehab in your home. Right. Everything you do can be approached from a, a rewiring perspective. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit later, whatever about the sleep, but yeah. Yes. You know, but the, uh, everything around, the, I mean, I, I look at everything in my house, everything as far as rehab. Yes. To, um, great. Change, change it up. I, I don't stick at the exact same thing That's that it. I do. Otherwise, right. I get, you get bored and right. you, know, you don't feel, because I cel- celebrate all those tiny little wins. That's it, it Jerry. Right? It could That's be exactly tiny. right. I mean, yeah. it's, it's real, neuroplasticity really requires three states that you go in and out of constantly. So the first one is repetition. Yes. The next one is novelty. And the third one is deep rest. So REM sleep is ideal, but you know, one of the things that I, wind up talking a lot about with stroke survivors is how common sleep disorders are after stroke. And this is another thing that doesn't get things that are kind of invisible kind of fall by the wayside, right? Mood, cognition, sleep. And so two thirds of stroke survivors do have disordered breathing after a stroke. There is another 20 to 40% of people whose circadian rhythm, and this is where I wonder Jerry about you is their circadian rhythm gets mixed up. So, you know, normally when the sun is going down, we're supposed to start producing more melatonin and less cortisol. And when sun's coming up, it's the opposite. But that very simple 24-hour sleep-wake cycle gets all fouled up after a stroke. But many people don't ever get the sleep study to diagnose what's going on. And then they don't know exactly how to treat it. So I'd love to hear what is your barrier with, with good sleep? Do you think, is it trouble staying asleep, falling asleep? Yes. I, um, I have to say, I know, I don't know how long ago, one of the lectures you gave, um, or maybe we talked, I don't know, a year or so ago about, but I bought an ultra and I'll tell you what, it keeps track of my REM sleep, but I don't get the REM sleep. Like if I can get a, an hour, maybe an hour and a half of REM sleep. Yeah. I'm good. I mean, I feel good, but I do. Yeah. Try to, I can't, I can't stay asleep. Well, what's challenging is we don't have a baseline on you, right? So we don't know what, cause REM sleep varies quite a bit by individual and actually too much REM sleep is just as bad as not enough. So what we see a lot in, people who get too much REM is depression. That's part Mm -hmm. of the idea of one of the underlying disturbances that causes depression. I actually don't know what is the optimal amount of REM for stroke recovery, but I I think it's very individual, but you know, that sleep tracker is probably the only piece of technology or really anything of any cost that I do recommend for folks because it's data And when you have the data, you could, so does it tell you like how many minutes it took you to fall asleep? It tells me everything, but when I first got this, I didn't, it kept me up because it, I didn't set it to what I was supposed to set it. And it just, it kept buzzing time to stand. Time to stand. So and only you know, three in the morning, time to stand. Right. Oh <laughs> so no. But so, I figured it so out. Ha- what what have you changed based on the data? What do you do different now for sleep? Um, I don't get on my phone, which I my, yeah. usually on my phone all the time because I have people from all over the world. So now I don't put the phone right next to me. Um, so yeah. I keep that um away from me and I keep make sure that um that the blinds are completely shut. Yes, um, yes. So I, and I, I think um, to go to sleep, it's really kind of strange. I, and I change the subject and I, I may be kind of weird, but I, I do change 
what I'm thinking all the time. And next thing I know, um, it's like three in the morning. And yeah. I feel because we get into bed about six, but then we don't fall asleep till about nine thirty. We watch things and then um then I and then I we fall asleep and then I have to tell Barbara, well, I stop snoring. <laughs> It's funny. Hopefully she won't watch this. But no, right. No. So, I, so, so putting away the device, that's great because yes. that, that blue light gets interpreted as our brain as strong sunlight. And so then we get the darkness and the light ratio fouled up. And with a stroke, you already have, you're predisposed to that happening already. So right. that's very good. And then trying to make sure, you know, we think about some of the basics, like you don't want noises. So do you guys put on a fan or like a white noise machine? A white noise machine. Yeah. Okay. It's only really for me because she could fall asleep like that. And right. uh, for me, I need the white no noise machine. Yeah. So I put that on and then it does help me go to sleep and it, I'm starting to get more sleep. I mean, yeah. I, I track it like even last night, but like you said about the REM sleep, I, I think the other night for the first time, I almost slept through the whole night, but I woke up not good. I was completely exhausted. Really, it was oh. maybe it's because I've been not sleeping the best. Well, I don't know. Yeah, there is something called a sleep debt. And so, you know, if you can think back when the kids were little, you know, you can go for a kind of a long time with not great quality sleep. Right. And you actually feel worse when you first start to get good sleep again. It's almost like your brain yeah. now craves it. Okay. And yeah. part of it too is, is if we wake up kind of mid cycle. So if you get woken up during REM, it's a lot harder for your brain to get back to its normal brain waves. Right, so right. Often, you know, that happens if you wake up and you were dreaming, that's typically a sign that you, you still had it. Have you ever had a sleep study, Jerry, since you had no, your stroke? I, yeah. I never had. Um, and I just think, cause I, I've been told you, for the weekend, I'm going to go, go through the uh, sleep study and yeah. they put all this stuff on me i think i'll get no sleep because of all that I, I, right but I, right I so, so now one of the benefits of the pandemic is they're a lot more comfortable sending you home with a kit so if you some people just don't feel comfortable sleeping outside their house i think it's worth it and the sleep labs kind of look like a hotel room okay. but if, if you do need to do it at home maybe ask your neurologist if he could find a sleep clinic that would allow you to do that but because then if you know mm. you could have sleep apnea and not know it and what's waking you up is that you stop breathing and if, if right. barb's snoring she might also have a little bit of you know you could tell her you wanted to get a couple special and do it together um but it's so important after any brain injury because in that deep REM sleep is where the magic of neuroplasticity is happening so two things one is the clearing out of right. you know in your case after a hemorrhagic stroke you probably still have some iron deposits from from the bleed, even though it was 13 years ago, it's going to be a long time to squeeze that out of every brain cell that was damaged. And then it's also the time where the rewiring happens the best. Right. So right. after a stroke, I think that's probably interesting. the number one recommendation. But you know what's tough too is it's a balance because we also see people get into trouble when they sleep too much and then they don't have enough time of being stimulated and doing those repetitive exercises. So right. trying to consolidate as much sleep at night, I think is key, but you know, sometimes people really struggle with neuro fatigue in that first year, two years, right. three years. So then, you know, I think a nap is okay, but you know, no more than a half hour, 45 minutes. Right. And we're trying to do it earlier in the day. Yeah. For the Actually, about maybe three years ago, it started getting really good. Where I I didn't or I wasn't getting neuro fatigue. I mean, yeah, wasn't yeah. getting the neuro fatigue like I usually got. But yeah. when I did have it, I still can remember. I'm exhausted, but I go right into the bedroom. I could just, all I need to do maybe is just to lay down, not even fall asleep. In five minutes, I'm up. And yeah. so, but that was my neuro fatigue. I did ha have some naps, maybe a, a half hour, like you have said. Right. But, you know, neuro fatigue is definitely one of the most disabling symptoms and not only just from your brain injury, but that's, 
getting back to the seizure meds. So, you know, in terms of cognitive side effects and fatigue, what we know is it's dose dependent. So the higher milligrams and 3000 is about as high as we typically go on Keppra. I respect your doctor's opinion. You could go higher, but then we also see much more effect when we have more than one seizure medication. That's why I emailed you this morning to say, yes. Hey, what were those yeah. meds? Um, and so typically, it, and it makes sense once you understand how, why, it works. So a seizure, if it's a burst of electrical activity, the seizure meds are really inhibiting brain cells from firing. And it's good because you don't get a seizure or you get a lesser charge from the seizure, but you also get processing speed issues or people feel like their problem solving is slow or they feel like they have brain fog. Right. Right. Yeah, and that... it, it's such a balance. Right. Yeah. I feel I do. Um, in the evening, my brain fog is it really comes back just yeah. because it, it maybe it's dumb tired. Um, but the brain fog is, I mean, 13 years later and I'm still getting it, but it's not as bad. I mean, things right. are, they do improve. And that's what I love to right. tell people. This, you do improve. Things will right. get better. Right. And like you said, it's going to take time, but. And it takes knowledge because I think so many people desperately want to get better, but they don't know the directions. They don't right. know the doctors just, you know, you get 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And that's and, it. You know, that's really why I started putting out my best information for free on YouTube because people, their future depends on knowing what to do. Like just take nutrition, for example. I think that's probably one of your secrets to success, Jerry. I know you and Barb try to eat real healthy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes it's not, well. <laughs> well, we're human, right? We don't have to be perfect. <laughs> no, right? but I don't, some of the stuff I don't really enjoy, but I know it's good for me. That's so, right. but and that's right. That is a big success for me. Eating right, right um, the right meals and right. exercising. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I, sure. we do that all the time. Right. And so I just wanted to to point folks who are listening to the MIND diet in case they didn't know about it. So that's the Mediterranean DASH diet. So yeah. it's a, a kind of a combination of brain health and also helps with hypertension. And somewhere in the show notes, we'll have a link to some free PDFs for folks on how to eat this way. Mm. But what, what I like about it, I mean, it kind of focuses on, you know, 10 brain healthy foods, and then it's some foods to minimize like certain kinds of meat and cheese and fried food, but it's very realistic. And even when you're not perfect, there's still benefit. So even people who were loosely adherent or people who were moderately in, in, adherent after a stroke, we see that they have much slower rates of decline. Cause you know, that that's one of the things that's really tough after a stroke is you are at higher risk for vascular related cognitive impairment. Right. And the, the end stage of that is vascular dementia. And so we do see that, you know, people are three to five times more likely as they age to develop vascular dementia, which, you know, is, is kind of a scary number. But how I like to position that is let that be your motivation to exercise, to eat well, to listen to your show, to listen to lectures, to figure out exactly what are the tools that will reduce that risk. Cause that's just people who, you know, they're not tracking how adherent people were to science-based recommendations, right? We don't know what they ate. So chances are they, they weren't doing it ideally. Right. And maybe that's one of my issues then too, back when I was working, I, I, I just ate what I ate. It wasn't yeah. a big, uh, what I'm doing now. Yeah. So the, so the focus for you, I believe is anti-inflammatory. Yes trying to eat whole foods, trying to stay away from processed foods. No salt. No salt. Yeah. One of the things I think folks would really benefit from another little gadget that you can typically get from your doctor if you have a history of anything vascular is a continuous glucose monitor. So they you know put them in the back yeah. of your arm and you have an app on your phone and you can track your blood sugar. Yeah. I think a lot of, we're learning a lot more about blood glucose and we know it's one of the two main fuels for the brain. The other one being oxygen, of course, but we haven't really understood how spikes in our glucose affect people who don't have diabetes. So a spike is 30 points high or 30 points low. Mm -hmm. And those are kind of those layers that I think of with my stroke folks. So you've got the stroke. 
but there's always things that are on top of it that are maybe making it worse. So like you said, when you get fatigued, right? when you have a bad night's sleep, but that can also be, you know, high blood sugar that can also be um, anxiety or stress. So a big thing for folks who've had stroke is let's identify all the additional layers. Let's not just reduce it down to your only target is stroke. Right. Let's think of everything else that influences brain health. So glucose is a huge factor. So when folks track their blood glucose levels, I think it's an incredibly rich data driven source to understand the impact of food choice on glucose and brain health. And sometimes people don't even understand like the impact of oatmeal, like oatmeal has fiber benefits, but it really spikes your blood sugar. Wow. Okay. Um, (laughs) Sometimes I, well, I'll eat the the flakes and stuff like that just by itself. Um, But I don't, you know, we don't, we don't drink uh, dairy, at least milk. Yeah. But, But yeah, it's a, like juice, you know, a lot of us were brought yeah. up to think juice is really healthy. Well, it, it's distilled of all the fiber. And so it's just going to really spike your sugar, uh-huh. you know? So, but I, I think all of these tools fall under the rule of you have to be your own advocate. You can't just accept, especially if you know, deep down your brain health doctor is not that invested in you. Yeah, exactly. And I always, I, I mean, this, I'm very good about every and I'll fit the right but every six months I get a full blood panel. Yeah. Sure. And I see the glucose, glucose, glucose. Yeah. Glucose. It's a mouthful. Yeah. Glucose. Yeah. yeah. And I see that yeah. on the, on the list. And, yes. um, and I always ask the doctor when I go in, can you please explain this? Good. Cause it, it, I don't know what it really means. I mean, for me, I don't know. So can you t- please tell me what each I love uh, item it. is? And right. So I, I, that's one of the advocacies yes. that I always yes. do. Yes, absolutely. And then, you know, what is an action step that they can yeah. have you walk away with to make it better? And then, you know, track it and go back and make it a continuous communication loop, not right. just something you talk about. I mean, oxygen and glucose being the primary fuels of the brain, those are the two most important things to track, I would say. The oxygen. Yeah. Oxygen. And, you know, like, and that would be, you know, if you have any kind of like pulmonary issue, like COPD or emphysema or, you know, asthma, you know, sleep apnea, making sure your oxygen is optimal. And then also the, the blood sugar. I mean, I think a lot of people, even without a stroke do have some degree of fuzzy thinking because blood sugar is either too low or too high. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's why I learned so much from you. I mean, this, is, <laughs> this is, and that's why I was excited to be on here with you because I know I'm going to learn something. And oh. every time listening to you, oh. it's just amazing. Mary, I, I think the key is that you have that beginner's mind, even though you have developed your own expertise, which is why you're here because you're <laughs> a bigger expert in stroke than I am, really. But it's, it's that perspective that there is knowledge out there. How can I get it into my own head and change my behavior? Right. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes after stroke, you know, you had mentioned before your family gave you some feedback. Maybe you were very depressed. Um, right. Post-stroke depression is so prevalent. And boy, I, I wish we could measure it if people were given optimal medical care, because I think so many times, and this has become a theme of my podcast is so many times the medical system worsens a brain health crisis. Yeah. And I've seen that too over the years, what I've been doing, but just wow. la- lack of information, yes. lack of aggressive treatment, lack of kindness, right. you know, not respecting that stroke oftentimes is a psychological trauma. It's not just a medical trauma. Right. Exactly. I, you know? I see that a lot. And, and luckily, just me, my support system is and what I mean, was and is continuously um, a great system, great support system for me. And it's, and it, I it think makes, that helps. Oh, it makes a big difference. But, you know, I often think, okay, for folks who 
maybe aren't as lucky within their biological family, you know, that's part of what I hope I provide, what you provide, you know, people like, you know, neuro nerds and yeah. all of these other great advocates out there is, you know, we're all very accessible. You can, you can get in touch with most of us and, right. and have a conversation. And I think that feeling of not being alone and knowing you have even just one cheerleader out there can make all the difference. Exactly. And I see that all the time. I, I mean, I keep thinking of a one person that I, she reached out to me at first and she was, she had just had a stroke and she was so depressed. And I talked, I'm sure you probably know out there, but she is so now like gung ho and it's only been a year and a half and she is, she sees that it's not an overnight, uh, yes, no overnight pill like right. I'm brand new. Yeah, it's right. so important in, in all of life to have role models that we can relate to. Yeah. That's why you know representation matters, whether we're talking about you know race, religion, uh, gender, whatever. But but also you know brain health challenge. It's it's really important to see a younger person who's you know had a hemorrhagic stroke because then you feel like oh wow he can actually understand what i've been through and that's why i've noticed too talking with everybody in in this community out there that you know you're not alone and if you ever want to talk to me i'm you know i have my website my phone everything there so you can uh awesome find it and they can you know find me and and i'm here for everybody i may not have the right answer but i'll right. find out Right. That's yeah. usually my promise too. I'm like, I don't know at all, but I can certainly point you in the right direction. You right, know? right. So what would you say, Jerry, are like 13 years later, some some ongoing things that you still feel like you're working on? So you, you mentioned, you know, some of the aphasia is still bothersome to you sometimes. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's funny though, I'm okay with it. Yeah. I just, I, I work on it all the time. I know I have to speak slower. Yeah. I'm, it, you know, I don't tend to do that. And then uh, my right side is affected. So I'm, and I, there's some things I'm a little more complacent on, which I shouldn't, but like yeah. the fine motor skills. Um, one of my therapists said, are you ever going to just uh, um, write with that hand in again anymore? Because I've learned how to use my left hand pretty Amazing. good. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but no, but I still do the little fine motor skills, which that's one of the big things I didn't like, but I still do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I just, my my thing is just be consistent, you know, just yeah. don't get complacent. Like I yeah, went yeah. in those little cycles, but don't get complacent, right. but work on something new every day. Yes. You know, and it, right. It, and and don't, different. don't resort to just doing the same old thing. Cause you're going to get bored. We all want newness. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Did yeah, you ever try mirror box therapy? I was just going to bring that up. Ah! <laughs> yes. Mirror therapy. I, now were you, I'll see. I'm trying to think. Did you? Yeah, you had it on your site. Yeah, I've talked about it. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh my gosh! When I first tried it, um, I was completely shocked how, you know, I had my therapist or Barbara looking in the the my hand in the thing in the mirror between it and uh, looking at me doing like just anything like that, and it this stuff works. It may not, it may not be right for everybody, right? But for me, it worked. Um, I think especially yeah. for your type of stroke, a left middle cerebral artery stroke, um, it, right. it really started through Dr. Ramachandran at uh, University of California, San Diego, looking at phantom limb pain. So people who had amputations and they look down and probably the message for a stroke person is you don't see your hand moving. It's not flexible. So there's kind of an alarm that goes back to the brain to say there's something wrong. And so we get that experience of pain. Right. Absolutely. Do you, do you have like kind of a, a numbness and tingling, unpleasant feeling in your right hand? Yeah. I, I, but I'm, I, I know it's not, well, it's only been 13 years, but it's still, I have it, but it's gotten better, but still yeah. I'm using a lot of uh, home therapy that I'm using um, to make that better. Yeah. But um, for me, and I know, again, I make this um, that it's not for everybody, but I, Every three months, I will go get Botox. I was just going to ask. Yeah. yeah on you my know, upper extent. I think that's one of our greatest advances in brain health care of the last 20 years. And not not enough people have access to it. And, yeah. And that's the thing about the insurance thing. Um, luckily yeah. for us, we do have the good insurance that that I can, you know, we can do that. So right. I am I go for usually every three months. It's been about yeah. a year, but every three months, because I didn't have an issue. But now... I'm feeling the tone, right? Um, 
So I go in next Wednesday and hopefully that all goes well. Um, but yeah, the Botox really makes a difference. After one week of getting yeah. it, then you got to work hard. Yes. So right. And that. then I, I would say too, do you know, do you try to like stretch it out or like massage it? Yeah. Just to give anybody any, cause I was trying to work on, um, uh, shaking hands, which I could do that fine. But so I kept pushing my hand, pushing it. But if you can notice my hand, uh, my, um, ligaments, my tendons yeah. are totally stretched out. And, uh, that's what I screwed up. So if you're going to do it, <laughs> You know, make sure your hand's straight and do it. Don't just like what I did. I was <laughs> like beating my hand. You were really up. enthusiastic. Yeah. So, but it's okay. It still can shake hands. I could, you know. Right. You know, so, but yeah, just be consistent. I mean, yes, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And then I would say the other thing for hand spasticity is dual task training yes. where you're trying to do something physical and cognitive. It's kind of like doing two things at the same time. Right, which is difficult as a stroke side for the most part. Very difficult. But, you know, that's that whole sweet spot of neuroplasticity. And you can yes. almost feel it once you're dialed in. If something's too easy, it's probably not helping you. And if it's too hard, you're not going to do it. Right. But you you really can almost feel. I mean, any even people who haven't had a brain injury, you kind of know when you're at your limit. Yes. And that's really the, the focus of brain rehab is to hit that limit over and over and over because it will, the ceiling will keep going up, up, up. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. I, see, right. I see that. Like I said, in the, be the beginning about celebrating those tiny little wins, yes. you, know, you get those bigger wins, but sometimes you don't notice them until look back on a year and you say, wow, it, right. it made a difference to do that. Even though you thought it didn't, but stick with it. Yeah, absolutely. And then what would you say about kind of, you know, I know we had talked a little bit before about the anxiety part of living after a stroke. And I, I wanted to just touch base on that with the respect that people with brain issues, it's important to recognize, of course, there are strict adjustment issues that can cause you to have anxiety or depression. It sucks to not be physically capable of what you used to be. It sucks to have people look at you different. Right, right. It sucks to struggle every day. You know, no day is easy, right? But I think what people don't understand enough is that so many brain injuries also can contribute to depression and anxiety. So like with a middle cerebral artery stroke, you know, we have those four vessels we talked about, and one of them goes to the frontal lobe, right? So if that were affected, what we might anticipate is before the stroke, you might have an anxious thought, but your frontal lobes would be able to put the brakes on that thought. Right. And you could more quickly distract yourself or just put it out of your mind. Right. Whereas after a frontal lobe brain injury, that break does not work as well. Right. And the perseveration of the thoughts can really drive people crazy, but they they feel like it's them or it's some kind of character issue. But I so badly want to just take people and shake them and say, it's a symptom just like your arm is a symptom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. For for me, when, I, when it gets to that point, I can tell when I'm going to get like my, uh, my anxiety, I immediately go to keep myself busy, do something. Otherwise, if I'm sitting around doing nothing, um, then I start to get those bad thoughts in my head. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if I keep myself busy, because um, I don't take any uh, anxiety medicine, I used to, but found out that was causing seizures because it, it mixed with everything. My pharmacist is the one that told me, not my uh, neurologist. Right. But, um, so, right. yeah, so I keep myself busy. That is one of the most important things. I'm I keep myself busy all the time. And if I'm not um, in the office or anything, I'm walking in my uh, in the house, back forth, back and forth. I'm looking at me steps on my watch. And, That's great. Yeah, so I'm kind of I'm keeping myself busy 100% of the time. Or I'm getting a call from or a, a video chat from another stroke star who just wants to chat. Yeah. And so I'm 100% right into that. I say, Barb, I'll be on the phone for a while. Just and I'm chatting with them and it makes me feel better when I'm talking to somebody else that yes. has had a stroke or right. some kind of brain injury right you know, just trying to help them helps me 
Oh yeah. yeah. The only thing I would say, and you know, this is cause I love you, Jer, <laughs> is, is the distraction definitely is mostly a positive coping skill. Mm-hmm. But the only thing is sometimes it can boomerang and contribute to sleep problems. So if you, if there's kind of underlying things that when you aren't distracted, keep coming back to you. Like a lot of people after a stroke, I mean, it is a traumatic event in that it was life-threatening. You felt helpless. Your world changed in an instant. I think, you know, I wish therapy or counseling was a standard part of stroke rehab because it's such a, can be such a out there human experience. But I would just say you have to balance distraction, which is positive from running from processing anything that is just very, very hard. Yes. Yes. The only, the, the only therapy, I, well, really not therapy was uh, while I was in inpatient, when I had my stroke, this gentleman always came into my room once a week, all the time. And I said, he always asked, how, how are you? How are you doing? Good. And uh, long story short, he was a neuro, neuropsychologist. And I didn't know that until about a month and a half later. I was in there for two and a half months in the hospital. Wow. I said, I, this is my friend now. I love this guy. <laughs> he would, I couldn't really say anything, but he would talk to me just gently. So um, yes. like I was his friend. And I thought, yes. this guy is so nice just to come to see me. And I have no clue who he is. Yeah. And well- if you, you know, think about it, the visitors that come to see somebody with a stroke, you know, it's it's either all business or it's a family member who's maybe very emotional or having their own traumatic reaction. So sometimes people who could just ask an open ended question like, how are you doing with all this? Right. You might think it happens a lot more often than it does, but it's actually very rare. Wow. Yeah. So I, when, when I um, worked on a stroke unit, that was one of my favorite things was not necessarily doing all the testing or, you know, but just having therapeutic conversations with people to give people the space to process what they've been living through. Right. Right. That was the only one, the yeah. only person in the hospital besides when I was able to say several words, then I could reiterate to them stuff and it was uh it, it was great i mean i i was probably one of the only ones that loved to be in the hospital I <laughs> and everything <laughs> i know but, some some inpatient stroke rehab also have a program which i think is awesome of stroke survivors who come in and kind of do rounds to give that role model example yeah i yeah. I, I do that now awesome Jerry. i go in there I, that's what i do and i do that that's my therapist call me and say, can you come and talk to this person? Oh yeah. Oh. I'm 100% up before I was not the one to talk to. I was, you know, I was more embarrassed that I had a stroke. Oh my God. So how long, you know, kind of taken a bird's eye view on the last 13 years, when, what year do you think was the turning point for you? Probably about, uh, let's see, 13. Cause 2010, it was, it was probably about 2014, 2000 that I really like, I, I can advocate for myself. I can do things, but it, that was one of the big turning points about probably four years after. But then when I got into what I'm doing now, that just tipped the scales. Yeah. For yeah, a, you, a great thing. Right. And you know, people have plenty of valid criticisms of social media, but the truth is it's yeah. free for creators. It's free for viewers. And it's just a way to share information freely. Right. Exactly. So I, I always encourage people to please find a group that's as specific to your journey as possible, because that's your tribe. And so many times people share tips so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You know, people can ask you about Botox and they don't have to try it out themselves. They can learn from you. Right. And I've seen people like like even me doing some certain types of equipment that help helps me that people are, you know, I'm, they're, um, dedicated to stroke so I, I reach out to them they reach out to me and yeah. i've been doing this now it's been great to see oh, other yeah. therapies that work and i've seen improvements because of that so it's just oh, not, yeah. you know the typical you know the squeeze ball or something right that, exactly you know. right well i love too you know that you've also worked hard to personalize your rehab i would say that that's a really important thing is 
the standard rehab can be modified to yeah. be a better match to someone's pre-existing interests because that's how your brain is organized. You have networks of brain cells that are organized around flying and being a pilot. So I love Barb's suggestion, like even though you can't do it like you used to, you can't be a pilot again, you could still be stimulated by those sights, those sounds, yeah. those Just conversations. Looking at the, looking right. at the airplanes, you know? Right, right. Yeah. And I think so many people feel like if I can't do it the way I always did, then forget it. But that is a way to power boost your rehab is, you know, even like you said, instead of using a therapy ball, you know, use a golf ball. If you were a golfer, you know, yeah. if you were a chef, use a lemon, like whatever you can do to make it where your brain cells are going to fire harder because it's right. unique to you. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I was talking to Barb about my show yesterday and my guest was, he played a, a bugle for us online and that's what he used to do now and he's using his affected hand for the, the little um you know little keys i love that and yes i told him i'm just gonna sell my drum set she goes if he could do it you need to get back on your drums and use it so the garage sale this weekend the, the community garage <laughs> sale it's not going out there so <laughs> i love that yeah, it, so. it has yes it's good for neuroplasticity and rewiring but I think, you know, some of the most important things people need to know is what's good for the soul is yeah. good for the brain. So, you know, if that's part of your identity, being a drummer, if that makes you remember some of your first concerts, you know, anything that creates a positive mood or a positive memory, it's kind of showering your brain in chemicals, you know, neurotransmitters that support recovery. Right. Right. So it, it's really it's important to do things that are meaningful. Don't if you feel like your rehab is just boring or yeah. it's drudgery, you got to be the one to to switch it up and and to change it. Yeah, yeah. That that was a good turning point for me. Was it this morning or yesterday about the? Uh, I love the that. But uh, I love yeah, that's that. so true. I I agree with you one hundred percent about oh. change it up. I mean, yeah. I you know because when you leave the hospital the inpatient uh, therapy they gave me a piece of paper and said you just work on this it was the same therapy it's like uh, i got done with that in a week now what of course yeah, yeah people are going to be bored but yeah. you know thank god we do live in this age where people can go on youtube and just type yes. in stroke recovery and you can get so much free high quality and from you want to make sure you're getting it from someone i think who's either lived it or who has professional credentials Right. You know, because exactly. there are some, you know, there's a lot of exploitation in the brain fitness world and supplements right. that don't work or brain games that don't really result in any appreciable improvement. But you're certainly one people should trust. And so your show um, broadcast on Facebook, on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, all the same time. All uh, that. We have Tuesday and Thursday um, at 10, uh, 11 a.m. your time in East Coast time. Let's talk stroke. Let's talk stroke. I love it. Well, I love to watch it when I can. I've been a guest. I look forward to being asked back, Jerry. Thank yeah, you. I, I, I'll make room like, <laughs> yes, absolutely. More than my, I get the chills when you want to be on my show. Oh, so that's so nice. My heart warms. So oh, thank you. Oh my God. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I think that the most important thing for me, Jerry, that I want you to know is how much I truly admire you. I, yeah. I really, really, really think the world of you and, you know, what you're doing is so good for yourself and it's so good for the community and it's so good for the world. You you set an incredible example of how people can turn pain into healing. Yes, I appreciate that very much. It, it makes me happy when they're happy. I'm, yeah. I want everybody to have a wonderful world. So, uh, you know, right. This is it's a journey. This is a lifelong thing. It doesn't get fixed overnight, but you know, I accept it and I can see the improvement. So, right. So find your people, educate yourself, yeah. expect positive outcomes, look for the small successes, yeah. prioritize sleep, eat the mind diet, uh, bring novelty into your world and do things that make your soul feel satisfied. Absolutely. If you have to get a second opinion, ah. Right. Right. And see a neuropsychologist. Absolutely. I know the the neuropsychologist world is a weight because you guys are so uh, well needed in the in the 
Yeah. Brain injury community. Yeah. You know, the, the wave of the future is that hopefully we're going to see primary care become much more well equipped to manage brain health challenges because when we project out how many neurologists we have in training and how many neuropsychologists, there's a big number difference. So some of my um, interest in the future are trying to empower primary care docs to be able to talk better nice. and more sensitively and to connect people with resources more effectively. Absolutely. And I don't have a uh, primary care because yeah. of that. Oh. I have neuropsychologists. Yes. Internal medicine. Yes. Which is, that's my primary care. Yeah. And a uh, neurologist. So it, that, that's, you know, I don't know if it's the right thing, but it seems no, like- No, I think, you know, the, the first rule of rehab in my stroke recovery guide is assemble a care team. And, you know, yes. that has to include, you know, you, you, you're on your own team, family and friends, but any special, I'd rather people have specialists than one generalist. Yeah, that's how I feel. Yeah, you want to find the specialist whose bread and butter is your problem. I don't, I don't want- <laughs> your problem to be, you know, something the guy sees once every month. I want it to be a, a woman who sees it 10 times a day. Right. Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Well, 100%. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right, my friend. Well, this has been so fun. And um, I'll definitely keep in touch. And let's just keep making each other better. Absolutely. And I appreciate everything you're doing, not only for, well, for me, but for the complete world of neuropsychology um folks that need you and uh, well really i love it i can't believe it's been five years since we've had i care for your brain and it'll be wow. 10 years i've had my practice in north carolina so i have a, a lot of milestones coming up good for you that's awesome yeah. and, and well, tell carrie i said hello too well i will yeah. all right jerry take care thank you again and we'll see you on my show next time awesome awesome okay. bye thank